Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at our second Art Matters Lecture of the Year here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Before I pass you over to our Deputy Director, who will introduce the speaker, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping for this talk. We are running it in a webinar format, so you can see us, but we cannot see you. The talk will be roughly 45 minutes long. If you have any questions you would like to ask the speaker, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You'll be able to type in questions throughout the talk and we will read a few out at the end as time allows. That's all from me. Thank you again for joining us today. And now I will pass the virtual floor over to our Deputy Director and Chief Curator, Ike Kung. Hello, and thank you so much, Alina, uh, as always, for organizing everything so beautifully. I'm really happy to welcome you to our second lecture in our Art Matters series. Uh, it's a special lecture series intended for those interested in the history of art. And, you know, fortunately, we were able to treat in sequential and chronological order 18th, 19th and 20th century Mexican art history uh, for this season. Uh, last week, we heard about 18th century casta painting. And this week, we're going to hear from Professor Moriuchi. Um, so just a few words of maybe to encourage you to identify yourselves a little bit. This is a virtual environment and new to me and to many other people, but um, we're always curious to know where you're from. Um, I think we're probably welcoming a more international audience. And so if you'd like to volunteer that information in the chat function, please do. So to introduce our speaker, Dr. Moriuchi is a professor of art history at La Salle University. Uh, she is, teaches a, on a variety of topics, including colonial to contemporary Latin American art, art and history of Mexico, art of the street, murals, monuments, and graffiti and art and identity in a global world. Um, her book, Mexican Costumbrismo, Race, Society, and Identity in 19th Century Art, examines representations of racial mixing in the construction of racial and social identities in 19th century Mexican art. And that appeared in 2018, and I'd highly recommend it. Um, it's a great read. Not only is she very erudite, but she writes beautifully, so it's quite easy uh, to read. And um, more recently, she's published articles on Wilfredo Lam and Frida Kahlo, um, and uh, very interesting work in uh, connection to Costa Brismo and Wilfredo Lem in uh, Smart Art History or Smart History, which is online. So uh, really interested to learn more from her. So please join me in welcoming her to the virtual stage. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I first want to thank you uh, to give this talk. Um, I'm particularly pleased to have the opportunity to share with you some information about 19th century Mexican painting. Uh, the 19th century is often overlooked in the history of Mexican art. Uh, and so I, um, I'm happy to have the chance to speak a little bit about the 19th century and its relations to the 18th and then the 20th century. I also wanted to thank Alina for helping me with the logistics and the, the back end. Um, and I also want to thank all of you. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy lives to be here. Um, I know it's been a pretty exhausting um, and stressful past two days. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time to be with me this evening. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have several images to share with you this evening. And let me just rearrange a couple boxes that I have on my screen so that I can better access my slides. Bear with me one second. So I thought what I would do is share with you a little bit um, about the origins of how I got into this particular field of, of scholarship. Um, I am showing you here a sampling of costumbrista works. Um, you'll notice some are paintings um, and there are some lithographs So the black and white are at the bottom here. And there is also a photograph, a costumbrista photograph. So I'm giving you a sampling here to show you that it is in multiple media. And I am gonna share with you a little bit about about the different forms. Um, costumbrismo uh, is a literary and artistic movement 
that happened in the 19th century, not only in Latin America, but also in Spain. Um, and it sought to represent the traditions, the customs, the costumes and scenes of everyday people and their lives. And so what you're looking at here in the sampling, you see some artworks that are focusing on individual types, often people of the lower classes, specific occupations. Um, and then others which show a uh, kind of intermingling of different uh, racial and social types coming together, either in interior tavern type scenes like the one on the upper right, or in an outdoor marketplace like the one on the upper left. So for those of you who tuned in last month uh, to Dr. Uh, Fitzpatrick Sifford's lecture on Costa painting, some of this will resonate with you. And so the first thing that I'm gonna share with you is that um, really the reason I got into this topic uh, was, was very much through Costa painting. And so um, if any of you are familiar with the arts of Latin America from the colonial period, um, you'll know that uh, the arts from the colonial period are, are tend to be highly religious in nature. Um, art during the colonial period was meant to um, educate uh, and convert the indigenous population to Christianity, to Catholicism. Um, so the Spanish conquest, right, was not only a political economic conquest, but also spiritual. So when I had the opportunity to see um, what you're looking at here is a series of Costa paintings, I saw it in Philadelphia. For the first time I saw the Costa series by Miguel Cabrera and it was part of this exhibition on um, colonial Latin American art. I will say that 90% of the galleries were dedicated to religious uh, art from this period. Um, not only paintings and sculpture, but also decorative objects, silver and the like that were used during liturgy and during sermons and masses. But the last gallery um, had this on display. And this display, as you see here, is more secular in nature. We have secular paintings, um, and we also have decorative, highly lux luxury objects, furniture and the like um, in the foreground. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Costa painting, what you're looking at is a series. Um, Costa paintings were done in series and they represented racially mixed families on a series of individual panels. And so what you're looking at here is an almost complete series at the time. Um, there, these were the ones that were available. There have been a few since that have been discovered. Um, but at this time, um, th what you're looking at, you, you read it basically from left to right. And so it's, it's establishing a racial and social hierarchy in New Spain um, with placing the Spaniards at the top of that hierarchical ladder and the indigenous and the mixed races at the, at the bottom. Um, so it's very much meant to be uh, read as a social and racial hierarchy. Um, and what you see is on each panel, there's a, a family of mixed races. So one of my questions, um, this led to a research project in Costa paintings, but one of my questions through this, this, that project was, um, what happened after the end of Costa paintings? So what happens to um, the genre, but what happens to representations of Costas after the 18th century? And there are a couple, a couple of thoughts that I'll share with you about that. Um, I also started to wonder what happened during the 19th century and why is it the forgotten century? Um, so those are some of the questions that were prompting me into the 19th century. I'm sharing with you here um, an example of a neoclassical equestrian statue from the early 19th century. Um, this is an equestrian statue of King Charles IV of Spain and it was done very much in the tradition of ancient Roman equestrian statue, like this one by Marcus Aurelius from the first century. And um, of, for example, that continues that tradition in the Renaissance with Donatello's Gatta Milata. And um, just because there's a relevance now of equestrian statues in, in our um, discussions um, today, I wanted to bring this in that this particular statue of the king survived because it was moved. Um, so you can imagine that once Mexico achieved independence in 1821, to have a statue honoring the king wasn't necessarily favorable. Um, however, this, this sculpture was moved for safety and um, has since, you know, has been now in a public space uh, um, after um, a period of time. So during the 19th century, what was happening was neoclassicism. 
And the academy was um, enforcing um, this uh, tradition, neoclassicism coming from a European tradition. And so here are a couple other examples of history paintings from the neoclassicist kind of period in, in Mexican art um, from um, the 19th century. Um, I won't go into detail about them, um, but I think those of you who are familiar with neoclassicism, perhaps you might not um, recognize the subject matter or the story. And these are very much trying to represent a Mexican history, um, the conquest on the part of the left, uh, a pre-Columbian story on the right. Um, but you might recognize kind of the, the, the architectural grandeur, the uh, tight brushwork, kind of the, the clean lines um, that are associated with neoclassicist art. So I was interested in um, thinking about what else, you know, what else was happening besides um, this grand scale history, this academic painting. I was also interested in approaching this from, from a later century, from the 20th century. Um, I had been exposed and learned about 20th century uh, modernism artists like Rivera, Ramos Martinez, I was familiar with their works. Um, so I was also interested about what, you know, what connections existed between the 20th century Mexican modernists and the 19th century artists. And what I discovered is that, of course, you know, Rivera and Ramos Martinez weren't working in a vacuum. There had in fact been a, a history of representing Mexican subjects, right, in the 19th century. And what you're looking at is, um, are two examples of carta de visita, uh, tarjetas de visita, or what they're called in Mexico, um, of lower class popular types. And you can see the resemblance here, the affinities in terms of subject matter. So these are some of the questions that are informed my research in the 19th century. Um, another, oh, another example, I forgot I have this in here. Another example is, of course, an example perhaps more familiar to you. Here you have a self-portrait by Frida Kahlo, um, who, you know, fashioned herself a la Mexicana and, and really was um, taken by um, indigenous dress. And she very directly is, is referencing a, a type from the 19th century. She's known as the China or the China Poblana. I'm gonna speak about her a little bit more later in my talk, um, but she was a type, an ideal female type that was known for being independent, for being beautiful, for being a mestiza, um, for being feisty. Um, and you see her you know, smoking a cigarette in the lithograph on the right. Um, and Frida Kahlo, I think, very much uh, fashioned herself in this image intentionally. She too was, you know, this beautiful, mestiza, feisty, independent woman. So before I begin, I do want to share with you some terms just to make sure we're all on the same page and, and um, the terms that I'm using are, are familiar uh, to you. So I've already mentioned casta. So casta refers to lineage or breed. And in colonial Spanish America, it refers to an individual mixed race. Castas include terms such as mestizo, mulatto, morisco, castizo. Mestizo and mulatto you're probably familiar with. Um, mestizo is, of course, a mix between Indian and Spaniard. Mulatto between uh, African and Spaniard. Morisco between Spanish and mulatto, and castizo mixed between Spanish and mestizo. And there are many other casta terms uh, to demonstrate further mixing, um, but I, I, will, I will talk about them um, when, they, when they appear in, in the imagery. Casta painting is the painting I've already just referred to, and is that 18th century painting that depicted racially mixed families on a series of canvases. While well, costumbrismo is that 19th century cultural trend, both in literature and in the visual arts um, in Latin America and Spain, I was concerned with representing local customs, types, costumes, and scenes of everyday people and their lives. So one of the things um, that's interesting is that the production of Costa paintings fades out at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century. In 1810, um, Mexican priest and revolutionary leader, Miguel Hidalgo, you see him in the uh, image on the right in a mural by Juan O'Gorman. He leads a group of indigenous and mestizo peasants in a revolt against the Spanish colonialist regime, ending with his famous Grito de Dolores under the banner of the Virgin of Guadalupe, which you see here on the right. 
during this time uh, you know, of independence, the Virgin of Guadalupe becomes a symbol of liberation. I'm also including an image on the left-hand side of the Virgin of Guadalupe by Miguel Cabrera, who is the same artist who painted the Costa series I just showed you. Uh, and during the colonial period, the Virgin of Guadalupe was seen as a symbol of conversion. She is a dark-skinned mestiza virgin who uh, 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 performs a miracle, um, miraculously appears to an indigenous peasant. So we have here her both a symbol of, um, of conquest, right, and symbol of liberation. So Mexico achieves independence from Spain in 1821. And a law passed in 1822 decrees that the citizens of Mexico could not be classified in official documents according to racial origin. So the usage of Costa nomenclature becomes kind of invalid. However, in actuality, the demands uh, that provided a window into different social and racial groups does not end. And this is what we see in costumbrista imagery. One of the things I wanted to mention is that this is this idea of representing everyday people, everyday lives, the people of a nation is not unique to Mexico in this moment. In fact, it's a 19th century trend. Um, and what we see is a whole genre of panoram what is called panoramic literature. And you're looking at here a series of frontispieces, the, 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 the um, opening images of the book, um, that are of albums of types. I mentioned it's a costumbrismo is also a literary movement. And so we have these albums of types that are created in the 19th century that are representing popular types or stock characters that are, that are, that comprise the nation. So what I just showed you here is this is the Mexican frontispiece for the Mexican album of types. But what you're looking at here is the English version, the French version, and the Spanish version. And this is just a few, right? The Dutch have their book, the, uh, the Belgians have their album of types. Um, in Latin America, there were two. There was Mex the Mexican album of types and the Cuban album of types. So you see through the title, Los Mexicanos Pintados por Sí Mismos, the Mexicans painting themselves. So this is a, this is a bit of a, an international endeavor. And what's important is that the, um, those writing and, and visualizing um, these types are of the literary elite. And they're interested in not only representing what is local, but making sure that Mexico is also uh, competing globally, right? Has a cosmopolitan presence, right? So they're interested in navigating both being unique, but also being part of European um, canon. Inside of the album, we have uh, 33 types in Mexican in the Mexico album. And I'm just going to show you a few here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about others in just a few minutes. But I wanted to give you a sampling. So within the album of types, there is an essay on that type, a very descriptive essay. Um, and then the, it is uh, accompanied by an image of that type. So you're looking here at, the, at three of those uh, lithographic images. Um, we have La China, who's a type that is very much um, unique to Mexico. We have an evangelista who's a scribe. There were other types of writers um, included in other books, other albums. In Mexico, it's a writer for hire. It's a writer that is um, meant to cater to the illiterate classes who can't do their, write their own letters. Um, and then you see the seamstress, which is a universal type, right? So you would have seen the, the seamstress in other European albums as well as the Mexican one. And another thing I want to point out is that the, 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 those that are creating the costumbrista images begin really with the traveler artist. So Traveler, European travel artists came to, you know, Spanish America in the wake of Alexander Humboldt, um, interested in representing what they saw really as exotica, right, as the, this new world for audiences back home. And so what you're looking at here are two, um, uh, in the center here, the ones in color, are two works by European artists. This one's by the German art, um, artist, writer Carl Nebel. Oops, sorry. 
And um, this one down here is by the French artist Edward Pangre. The two black and white lithographs on either side are by Mexican artists. So we really have this exchange, right? There's this um, between European uh, traveler artists and Mexican artists. Um, there's an exchange here between uh, different medium, right? It's an in, uh, intertextual um, dialogue. And again, I, I, I present this sampling because I'm gonna go into some of these now in more detail, but again, you get the sense of the variety of, of works that are being produced out of this period. Some again, focused on individual types, um, others on uh, an interaction at larger group setting. So one of the first things that I started to, to look into was this, what I saw what, as a continuation of um, Costa painting and Costa uh, traits in Costumbrismo. There was a continuity between the genres that I wanted to, to dig deeper and, and understand. And so I'm going to focus um, on a couple things about to demonstrate that continuity. The first thing, and, and I, I, I call them racialized social spaces. Um, in, in the first few images, I'm going to show you a continuity in the representation of occupations. And um, one of the occupations that was uh, common in both Casta painting and costumbrista painting uh, was that of the aguador or the water carrier. And here again, you see various images of the water carrier literally is transporting clean water to homes. Um, you see him here by an Italian artist, Claudio Lenati. He was the first artist to bring lithography to Mexico. Um, and he's literally doing you know, hard labor, right? Um, he's got this heavy jug of water on his back. Um, he's got to lean forward to maintain his balance. Um, he, here, you, you, this particular water carrier on the left, in pants, right, bare feet. Um, this uh, work is by an, the French artist, again, Edward Pangre, and then this one is by a Mexican artist named Ezequiel Irierte. And you can see that by the, the Mexican version, uh, he becomes a little bit more erect, more poised, cleaned up. He's got shoes um, and doesn't seem to be as heavily, heavily burdened by his wares. Here is a costumbrista painting by Pangre, also with uh, the water carrier and two indigenous servants. And we see it in a Costa painting on the left. So again, the Costa paintings from the 18th century, uh, the costumbrista painting on the right is from the 19th century. The context changes, right? But there is a representation of that water carrier figure that occurs uh, regularly. Uh, in the image on the left, that is a union, a family union of uh, a mix of a family that comes from the lower classes, racially mixed. So you'll notice in the title there, we have an Indian father, a return backwards mother, and their child is called a wolf. So uh, I won't go into detail into the nomenclature unless someone's interested. But here, the, the mother here is referred to as uh, return backwards is a, um, a descendant of African uh, of African she's of African descent mixed African descent um, and you can see the the boy there is referred to as a wolf right so these terms become more and more derogatory as the further mixing happens right the further more impure you are on the right hand side with Costumbismo it's very a picturesque scene, right? Um, it's a very tranquil scene. Uh, I'll point your attention to a cross that's etched above the doorway, right? This is, um, these subjects are uh, dutiful Christians um, and peaceful, right? They're very um, harmonious about it. Um, and I just, I wanted to bring this in, um, in a recent trip to Mexico, uh, Mexico is still dealing with water issues, um, as some of you may be aware of. And this is the 21st century water carrier of Mexico, right? At most, if you can afford it, um, you uh, get clean water for, for drinking and cooking um, by having uh, water transported to your house. So 
other occupations that are repeated, right? Here we have a Costa painting again on the left with a vendor, the father here is a vendor. On the right hand side, we have an unusual nighttime um, costumbrista painting, um, also depicting a vendor and a group of people that are uh, selling, eating buñuelos, which are a type of donut that's dunk in syrup. I wanted to at least um, give you two names to remember. Um, again, the 19th century artists aren't necessarily um, well known. So I'm going to introduce you to uh, two of them. Um, the first is Jose Agustin Arrieta. Arrieta is from the uh, city of Puebla. Puebla is a city uh, about 90 miles uh, away from Mexico City. Arrieta trained in the Academy of Puebla um, and he very much focused, his career is focused on representing uh, everyday people, it seems, and traditions. And here you see four of his works in a highly you know, realistic manner. I'm gonna focus on a few of these. The first one is his painting called La Sorpresa, which means the surprise. Uh, I'm going to draw your attention to the center of the composition. There is a group of three figures that I argue is akin to the family unit in Costa painting. And here again, we have a father, a mother, and a child, but they're no longer stratified in a composition, you know, a panel on their own, um, but rather mixing in with a diverse populace. Uh, the mother here uh, is being pulled away uh, by the husband, perhaps, and her son here is tugging at her, her skirt. I want you to also notice what might be the cause of, of that action or interaction from her family members. And so if you look to the left where her gaze takes us, you find another figure on the left-hand side of the composition. She is dressed in this black uh, kind of cloak and dress um, and seems to stride very swiftly back by on that left left-hand side, and the two women form like a, like a parenthesis almost. So the women uh, are seemingly in some kind of dispute, and we might think of the woman on the right as someone of the lower classes, mixed race lower classes. You might notice her bare feet. Uh, on the left, right, the woman in black seems uh, most likely is a criolla. Coyoya was a, a person who was born in the Americas, but of Spanish descent, so higher on the high colonial or hierarchy. And then you might notice also, there's a bunch of stuff going on. We've got beggars and um, another couple back here, and there's some kind of um, fruit and st stand there, but there's a little detail down here of two dogs uh, romping around. And um, the black uh, for a dog is about to kind of pounce on to the white one. So I'll hold, just hold that idea or thought. Um, so the tension is, is displaced a bit to, to the pets there in the foreground. In Costa painting, we sometimes saw uh, altercations um, in scenes like the one on the left. Uh, they were rare, but they existed. Uh, and it represents a uh, bias, right? A prejudice that Black uh, African uh, women in particular had an aggressive or violent streak. And so here on the left, you see uh, the mother here about to strike the husband and the little girl, her daughter is tugging at her skirts. A similar compositional element that we see over here on the right. Arrieta also uh, painted this, this work. This is called the um, popular market scene with soldiers. So here we have a, another market outdoor scene commingling of various, um, we've got soldiers in the, in the right over here. One looks out at us to draw us in, right? These scenes tend to be a bit theatrical, right? They suggest a narrative, a story. In the center, we have a family unit not unlike a Costa painting family unit. 
we have a couple here where the, the man seems to be bothering the woman and she's pulling away um, a little bit like what's happening here, right? Without the, the child. Um, and then we have another group of, of figures over here, a, a kind of a street urchin, a, maybe an inebriated man here, a cloaked mysterious man in black and uh, a woman that's covered, um, an older woman covered in blue uh, over here hunched over. And she potentially is a, a Celestina or a procuress, um, maybe trying to find a, a woman uh, for this uh, uh, man. Here's a, an example of a Costa painting of a family under a, a tent or tarp, right? Selling their wares, not unlike what's happening in the Costumbrista version on the right. So in Costa painting, the kitchen was the location um, most often used for this family mix, this union, uh, which is between a Spanish father, a black African mother, and a mulatto child. And so you see the same mix in both of these. This is number four in both of these series. They're by two different artists. Um, in Costa painting, there was also a, an endeavor and objective, right? To, to represent some of the natural resources, exotic resources. And here you see on the right, the fruits and vegetables in the foreground are numerically classified on the, on the top part of the composition. Remember, this is the Enlightenment period. It was important to classify everything. On the left-hand side, we have other resources native to the Spanish Americas being highlighted. Chocolate here being mixed on the stove, tobacco here being uh, lit by the father. In Costumbrista painting, the kitchen was often the location for um, the indigenous servants that worked there in the household. Um, notice the appearance of the aguador or water carrier here, um, flirting with one of the, the maids. We've got the women here on the left working, making tortillas, right on the comal. Um, again, we see the appearance of the cross, right, to suggest these harmonious, um, devoted, dutiful, uh, lower Christianized, right, lower classes. For Arrieta, his of the Poblana kitchen, which you see here, is a little different than some of his contemporaries. And its inclusion of a China Poblana is notable. And it's not just a typical China Poblana, and I'm referring to this figure here, but a, a blonde China Poblana. The China Poblana typically was a dark-skinned mestiza woman. And here he depicts her as a blonde. So that's curious. And, and um, I'll make a couple comments about potential meaning that can be derived from, from that uh, decision. She stands here um, next to, again, potentially uh, the Celestina character, that type, that procuress, finding a suitor for uh, the China Poblana. And the China Poblana, you can see, has her hand on a guajalote, which is a, uh, and perhaps as a sign, right, of what is to be uh, the meal for the evening, potentially a mole poblano. Some of you might have uh, had that dish, um, a complicated uh, sauce made of hundreds of ingredients of chocolate and chiles and so forth. And it's a specialty of Puebla. Placing women, um, uh, sexually available women or suggesting their femininity, their sexuality next to fowl, right, is not uh, out of the ordinary. We've seen it, there's a tradition of it, and I'm showing you here an image of a 17th century Dutch painting um, that suggests, again, the, the women's uh, sexual availability promiscuity here as she is holding, right, this fowl. That's important, right? Arrieta is familiar with this tradition. And I'll make another point about his awareness of European art history in, in just a minute. I want to make this connection back to Costa painting. 
What I'm showing you on the left-hand side is a Costa painting uh, by an unknown Mexican artist. And it is of a family uh, that in con consists of an albina, uh, which is a um, uh, not, it's a light-skinned woman, um, but is one uh, descent of, of black African origin. Um, and um, I can again explain that a little bit more in the Q&A, but basically her light skin was a, um, a way for them to try and understand how it was possible through racial mixing to have lighter skinned um, uh, progeny. She's uh, the mother, the father is a Spaniard and their son is called a throwback um, or return backwards. And he um, has darker skin. Again, it's so showing that, um, that heritage. As a blonde, right, product, uh, female, uh, right, of racial mixing on the left, right, we find something very similar on the right. And I suggest that Arrieta is very much in tune, right, with this racial diversity that is Mexico and is interested in probing this racial mixing and visualizing, right, what this could look like the possibilities. And so yeah, he throws out a blonde China Poblana. Here are some samplings of, of how China Poblanas were typically represented here, right? Dark skinned, uh, mestiza, uh, female, beautiful, right? Idealized character wearing a specific costume too. I didn't mention the costume, but her costume is very particular to her type, the full skirt, often with the floral pattern, the white blouse, the reboso, which is the shawl. Um, in some of these, you see her smoking again, suggesting her, her independence, right? She's also known to be a great dancer. So you see the lower image here. For Arrieta, he was preoccupied with this idea of racial mixing and he produced uh, several paintings of blonde China Poblanas. Um, and you see here again, the, the appearance of the procurus and you see the, the open, right? Very lush fruit. Um, again, once again, suggesting um, sort of uh, her sensuality or sexuality. So Arrieta um, was an artist, uh, as I mentioned, from Puebla. And this is a photograph of a house, now a museum in Puebla, uh, that belongs to a family, a generation, uh, of, uh, several generations of this family, Jose Luis Bello y Gonzalez. And they were uh, merchants. They were wealthy merchants in the 19th century and they um, were great collectors of art. And this is an, an example of the type of stuff that they collected, right? This is how they decorated their homes. It was full of everything imagine, from Chinese porcelain um, to, you know, this decorative mudejar um, furniture, paintings by Zurbaran, Murillo, Spanish golden age masters, and then next to one of those Zurbarans might be a painting by Arrieta himself, right? So Arrieta was uh, aware of this tradition of, of art history, um, this canon of art history, and was very much in, in the part of the collectors, uh, right? A, a, a part of that history of art. Um, a lot has, of work has been done to show the importance of religious prints, European prints on Mexican uh, Latin American art, um, not so much on secular prints, but there is very, uh, there is, you know, exists um, in this collection actually uh, 17th century Dutch prints that I'm sure Arrieta had seen. So another artist I want to uh, share a little information about is Felipe Santiago Gutierrez. And he is uh, another artist who is, he's from Toluca, uh, Mexico, and he trained in the academy. And I, I didn't mention this, I forgot to mention, but the Academy of Art it was uh, founded in Mexico in 1785. It's one of the first, it is the first in Latin America. Uh, and just to give a little bit of context, um, the, in the United States, uh, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts was our first academy and that was founded in 1805. So Mexico had established its academy, modeled it off of the European academies um, very early on, right, in, 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 in the terms of the 18th century. And it had um, particular influence on these artists throughout the 19th century, and Gutierrez is no exception. So he trained in the academy, 
Um, but interestingly, and let me show you a few of his academic paintings. So here, you know, he trained in the classicism. He was also the artist who painted the first female nude. So I'm showing an image of that on the right. But he, he preferred, he championed costumbrista art. And he was not only an artist, he was also a writer. So he wrote treatises and he wrote art criticism and he really uh, believed that for Mexico to achieve uh, kind of the status that it deserved, that the artist needed to paint and turn to and represent uh, the people that comprise that nation. So here's a quote from one of his, his books, his treatise. The genre painter's scenes are temples, public plazas, the streets and the countryside. His paintings of a fruit vendor, a florist, a group of proud boys that ridicule a drunkard or a blind man who goes door to door, covered in rags, asking for suddenly and poetic. When translated to canvas with the magic of his brush, they cause admiration among his contemporaries and he is glorified for posterity. And so I show you a few of his paintings to show you how he visualized uh, this sentiment. Here is a work by him called um, The Young Indian's Farewell. Uh, and it depicts a, a young boy uh, who is, has gone to his family you can see an extended family here in the center of the composition to say goodbye. He's about to go to the city to get educated. You can see here also Gutierrez's awareness of um, Dutch painting um, through uh, these opening doorways um, that you see on either side that, that open up the picture plane, right? They do opening up the composition. There's a lot that he's also taking from um, the tradition of, of realism in, in earlier genres of, of painting. Gutierrez also painted uh, types, uh, singular types, individual types. Here you have uh, the woman, Indian woman with marigold. The marigold was a symbol, an Aztec symbol of mortality. And perhaps here uh, is, is uh, symbolizing maybe the, the fragility of life of this expectant mother. It's also a flower that um, is placed on graves uh, during the Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead celebrations, and is believed to guide the dead towards the living. So here she uh, contemplates very peacefully, right, the fragility of life. Um, here is another work by Gutierrez called India de Oaxaca. And although these works are of Mexican types, he most likely painted them while in Colombia. Uh, Gutierrez was also a traveler artist. We tend to think of travel artists as only European, but that's not true. He was also a travel artist to San Francisco, New York, Europe, uh, Colombia. He was important in uh, creating an academy of art in Colombia and Bogota. Um, so he was an influential artist and writer and teacher. Here is his beggar. Um, and um, you can see, you know, again, through an amazing detail, right? Tiny brush strokes. There's a real sense of the, the naturalism, the wrinkles on the forehead, um, the, you know, the fuzziness of the beard, the roughness of the, of the cloak there. Um, and yet you see a, a bit of um, his sleeve, right? His torn sleeves perhaps suggesting a, a more uh, illustrious past, right? Someone who's come on, on hard times. On the right, is a work by Arrieta, just to serve as a kind of comparison. This is his version of a beggar. Um, both tend to uh, individualize uh, the beggar type. Um, and there's a real sense of, you know, at least on the right of that gaze, right? Kind of directed straight out at the viewer, drawing the viewer in. And here I, I just put a sampling of them together to give you a sense of uh, his, his various types. And here I wanted to suggest uh, a connection forward, right, to the 20th century. The work on the right is an early 20th century work by the artist Saturnino Arran, and it is called The Offering. And it too uses the marigold, right, that flower that 
symbolizes mortality and the fragility of life um, as a motif, right? This is about um, the Dia de los Muertos and you see a, a whole generation of individuals um, as part of this composition. You can tell, right, this is now a 20th century work. Look at the diagonal lines, the flattening of space, the unmodular, right? There's, it's a different moment. And you can see that Gutierrez is a little bit be maybe behind his times, right? He was championing um, this notion of capturing Mexicanness or Mexicanidad, but his style wasn't quite modernized yet still rooted in the classicism of um, the 19th century. And lastly, I want to share with you a little bit um, more images from photography, from costumbrista photography. Like in painting, we have European photographers uh, and Mexican photographers. The two works on the bottom are by European photographers. The two works on the top are by Mexican photographers. Um, the ones on the bottom, you can get a sense that they're staged. Um, well, they're all staged, they're all constructed, but you get a sense that they're staged in a studio, for example, here, right, in an interior space. Um, it's clear that it's, you know, it's been um, constructed to create this, um, this scene, almost like if he just you know, took that fruit vegetable vendor off the street and told him to stand in that studio to get that photograph. The works by Mexican artists attempt to make it a little more natural by creating a backdrop. And so here you see the tortillera in the act of rolling out tortillas within a, a scene, right, a kitchen space, and the water carriers placed outside in front of a water spout. Here are a few other examples. Again, the tarjetas de visita were um, often uh, photographs of lower class occupations and they were collected. They were collected by uh, the elite, rather really, um, to showcase a kind of uh, sampling of the types of people one could find in Mexico. And again, uh, I draw the connection between uh, the Mexican mod and the costumbrista photographers and artists from the 19th century. The Mexican artists that of the 20th century that were so interested in capturing what is known as Mexicanidad or Mexicanness, right? The representation of Mexican culture and identity, right? Was not unique to the 20th century. It was an endeavor that had begun earlier. And we see that through Costumbrismo. Thank you very much. That is the end of my talk and I'd like to, if possible, open up the floor to any questions the audience may have. Hello, thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. And uh, yeah, you did receive already some questions. You can use the Q&A function, those of you still with us, if you want to pose a question. Um, here, let me read uh, the first one, uh, which is from Elizabeth Springer and she asks, in the Costa paintings, were the women shown in family groupings always married to a man whose race represented a higher class or caste, or was the woman ever of the higher class? Um, there are occasions where the Spanish, um, trying to think of some examples, where the mother is the Spaniard, um, it's, it's rare, um, but even more often, I would say the mother is sometimes um, the castiza, which is a union between Spanish and Indian. By if there was a concept known as blood mending. So it was believed at the time that the more, if you were indigenous um, origin, the more you mixed with Spanish, you could become Spanish again. And so some in the series show um, that Spanish uh, woman as the, the progeny of the further mixing. It is more typical to have the father be a Spaniard, however. Okay, great, thank you. And um, this one is from one of our curatorial assistants uh, who is a 19th century uh, 
print specialist and she wants to know uh, what role did lithography play in differentiating Costumbrismo works from Costa paintings? Were Costa paintings also reproduced as lithographs during the 19th century or was this reserved for Costumbrismo types? That's a great question. Um, so Costumbrismo, uh, sorry, the lithography as a, as a medium doesn't come to Mexico until the 19th century. So it wasn't available um, during the Costa per period of time. And um, to my knowledge, Costa paintings were not reproduced in lithographic print format. Um, it really becomes a genre that's initially associated with uh, costumbrista artists and um, print uh, book publications, um, not so much for representing paintings from the past. Great, thank you. Uh, from Jeffrey Petty, any sculpture that depicts the costumbrista idea? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so um, not what you would consider, I guess, uh, traditional sculpture, but there were lots of figurines of costumbrista types that were you know, smaller in nature, you can still actually buy them. Um, and those were produced during the 19th century. So more um, you know, three-dimensional, but not in the, the sense of a you know, marble sculpture, not like that, more of a smaller version of kind of a collectible. Um, I had a question for you just in terms of consumption. Um, who uh, were these marketed to the custom Brisbane of his paintings? I mean, was there a specific class of people? Was it an international sort of affair or um, just specific to Mexico itself? Yeah, also a great question. So um, the costumbrista imagery had a, had a following, um, the paintings per se. They were often, if they were exhibited at the academic exhibitions that were held yearly or every two years, they were often exhibited in a room for kind of outside artists. And there were several collectors that sought them. This is, the collectors uh, are of the elite classes. You know, not, I mean, when you think of Costa painting, it too was, there's a, there's a sense that they were created for um, you know, ecclesiastical authorities, the viceroy, that sort of thing. And they were sent back to Spain, although there were still were a, a series of bodies of work that stayed in Mexico. Costumes were more, I guess, um, uh, exchange. Um, they were smaller, right? They're just one, there's not a huge series, but um, they were still collected by a literary elite. Um, and as I showed that one photograph of the, um, of the shot of the house of the that is now a museum, that is the type of collector, for example, that would have collected these works. Very worldly, very knowledgeable. They had collections of art from all over, um, you know, is, is including European, you know, masters, um, but also Mexican artists that depicted local uh, people and scenes. And so. Um, I would say that you know there was really an exchange, and that the artists of the Costumbrista artists were enmeshed in that larger history of art, and it was part of I think these savvy collectors, elite collectors. And so to get back to one of the original questions that you posed at the beginning of your talk, so um, what generally would you say is the reason for the sort of absence of the 19th century? It's sort of like 18th century cast of painting has become a fascinating topic to many people. And then often one leaps right into 20th century modernism and the more familiar names that you started out with. So is it really a victim of the elevation of modernism that has led to the neglect of the 19th century in, in this narrative? So Mexico, um, I mentioned, goes through independence right in the beginning of the 19th century. It was a time of extreme political turmoil. There were like over 40 presidents in this time period. There was a lot of uh, just change. There is no stability politically. And I think that's part of it. I think there's a sense that there was, um, there's some uh, traveler writers that talk about visiting Mexico um, in the 19th century to find the arts in neglect, right? That the kind of this 
academy had lost its luster um, and there, you know, there really wasn't a tradition that was being maintained. And I think part of it is because of the political turmoil. And so um, there's this disruption, right, in, in the establishment of the arts. It's not to say that art wasn't happening though. And I think that's, um, that's the sort of question of to figure out what was happening, right? And what was being represented and how did um, the turmoil that was happening politically and, and economically, um, how did that manifest itself through the visual arts? And what we find is that there was this desire to reclaim what was Mexican for Mexicans and to, uh, to visualize what the Mexican people and their traditions looked like. So I think that is what comes out of, of the turmoil is this desire to, to represent um, the Mexican people to create a, a national identity. Right, right. Um, so here's another question from Melissa De Soto. What cities in Mexico presently have the best museums and focus on the arts? Guadalajara, I heard, is one city with lots of art. Mexico City. <laughs> Mexico City is where you go to see um, the arts. There's, um, it's the most concentrated there. So again, I would say, um, you know, Guadalajara has some great murals. Um, Mexico City has many museums um, that are dedicated to various uh, periods of Mexican art. It certainly has a lot of the costumbrista work. Um, the other city I would I would recommend for, um, for Mexican costumbrismo is Puebla. Uh, and there is also um, uh, in Toluca, where Gutierrez is from, there's a museum dedicated to Gutierrez that shares a building, a uh, country artist, which I did not mention, but I should have, and that is the landscape artist Jose Maria Velasco. So that name might ring a bell. So um, there was a tradition mainly through Velasco of landscape painting in the 19th century. And I think it stems out of, again, that desire to represent the, the landscape, right? That is Mexican um, and, and it has ties also to, to establishing that sense of national identity. Um, so those would be the, the main, but I would say primarily Mexico City. If we can ever travel again, that's where I would go next. That's where I want to go now. <laughs> You've definitely inspired me to want to travel there as soon as possible. Um, and then here's another question from Jeffrey Petty. Uh, he says, what about Magana? I don't know if that's the last name of another artist. Uh, tell me how that's his spelling. M-A-G-A-N-A. I don't know. I don't. Sorry, I'm not familiar. If that's a specific artist, or I'm not familiar with uh, that artist name. Okay. Yeah, he didn't follow up. So um, anyway, he might have already left. Um, you know, there's just one thing I wanted to uh, just comment um, because this material is just so fascinating to me on so many levels. And, you know, I've spent a long time in 19th century, largely European art and mostly French art. And we're organizing, Rachel, uh, my assistant who asked the question, uh, we're organizing a big Van Gogh exhibition. And the thing that's become very clear is the universal um, fascination with social types. And, you know, the thing that I think uh, people often uh, don't recognize is that an artist like Manet, for example, is very much responding to the same tradition, um, which goes all the way back to the Renaissance, really, in, in Europe, of representing social types. And, you know, even very familiar images like old men by Rembrandt in print form, that's really still participating in this same desire to filter all of society into different categories. And, you know, what's funny is that I think it still very much goes on today in visual culture in many different ways. It takes different forms, especially in terms of, you know, sort of genre in film, but genre also in everything on 
Netflix and all of these different representations of the interaction of people of different class and uh, different racial backgrounds. So, you know, it's, it's something that uh, has a very, very long history and there's probably much more intertwining between uh, what's happening in uh, Mexican costumbrismo and everything that's happening in probably more familiar canonical European art, avant-garde art of the same era. So, you know, there's a way of putting all of these things back together again. It's just so interesting how um, specialized areas of art history tend to remain very much siloed from, from one another. And certainly Van Gogh is so much a part of this. If you think of famous painting like L'Arlesienne, the Arlesian woman, you know, it's again, a very specific type in that case, a Southern French provincial type, but um, it really helps to see all of this as a big piece and, you know, to make it all part of one world because it, it really is. It's just that certain um, areas of the world have been marginalized, um, you know, for many any very complicated reasons. So I'm so grateful to you for bringing light to this subject. And um, I'm sure that our audience is just really appreciative. And we're really hoping that uh, next week's lecture on Mexican modernism will pick up on the threads that you've pulled so far for us. Um, but thank you so much for your time. It was a really delightful lecture. And um, I hope that people will find your, your book and um, your other articles and continue to engage in your incredible discourse. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, I think that's about it. Thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you'll join us for the next uh, lecture, First Thursdays, don't forget. Bye.